Foot Clan, I'm so excited about today's show. Mike is back, and we're talking about fantasy wild cards. Wild cards! That's right. Do not miss a minute. Leave a comment, like, subscribe, enjoy the video. Welcome to the Fantasy Footballers Podcast with your hosts, Andy Holloway, Jason Moore, and Mike Wright. Ah, welcome in. Thursday, June 9th. The fantasy footballers back at full strength. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mike Wright has returned. Brief absence. Brief absence. Welcome well, in, Mike. D- virtually, I mean, to the to the user at home, they are none the wiser that I am right. not there. But yes, I'm I'm here for the recording. I'm here for my hot, spicy takes. Yes, we have a wild cards episode today. Jason Moore is here as well. I'm a wild card. You've always been a bit of a wild card. <laughs> That's right. And uh, the deucers, we've got two thirds of them in the building. Say hello if you want. Hey, what's up? And uh, Mike is entertained. Yeah, not the greeting you expected, Mike. Well, it's just, it's always so incredibly awkward when they like jump on the mic because they, they just, they're not really sure. Should I jump in? What do mm-hmm. I say here? And it's just, it delights me every time how it, it remains awkward every mm-hmm. time. <laughs> yeah, we're over a thousand shows in. Yeah, it's still it's like great. every time. Um, <laughs> yeah, I can assure you it's equally as awkward for us. <laughs> yes. Did you, it Mike, comes through. Did you hear the, uh, the mailbag drop from the Tuesday show? No, I heard uh, the deucers handled it, but I have well, not gone back yet. That's right. We, we kind of had a moment on the air where we said we might, it, what it seemed like we might just choose somebody to do it. And, uh, craftily, Al just said, Hey, we'll all do it together. He did as, as, not uh, want to be singled out. He was very fearful. And then on the the footcast this week, I made Andy do it by himself. So go check that oh out. Oh boy! Clan. Oh boy! Yeah, uh, is, is that what I did? Thank you for joining us today. YouTube.com slash the Fantasy Footballers. Twitter at the FF Ballers. You can find us on Instagram. We're on TikTok. We're wherever social media things are. Fantasy Footballers over there. Brooks is smiling. Are you a TikToker, Brooks? Do you tick to the talk? <laughs> no, I don't. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, I, I he's got that. a huge channel he does all the dances oh man that would be so great i don't know what kind of reward i could give you if i discovered that late into the game like thousands of subscribers in like of all <laughs> of us in the office who would have if they actually had a real popular channel doing the dances which one would be the best yeah i mean i, I it's ironic because it somebody the worst somebody asked us who was the best dancer in the office and none of us could remember ever seeing you dance at all. Oh, I'm terrible. So we all went with uh, our developer, Andy Schneider, who, yeah. you know, we just feel like he's kind of good at everything. So he's probably yeah. pretty good at dancing. Yeah, I've never seen him dance. I'm sure he crushes. Probably. Jerk. Um, quick question of the day, gentlemen. This one comes in from Twitter. Is there a quarterback wide receiver stack you're interested in drafting at their current average draft positions? So... I mean, it's fun. I in fantasy, it's fun to have a stack. I uh, I I don't go into my draft saying I have to get one, but when the draft goes a certain way and that opportunity is sitting there, it it's a situation where I might move a quarterback up around uh, to get it. Yeah, and if you're in best ball, I think stacks are even more important. They peak your uh, performances. If you're getting a quarterback who has a good day and you've got his wide receiver, chances are you maximize points. So I look for it. More in uh, in best ball. My go-to quarterback wide receiver stack this year is actually the one that Mike is going to talk about. Uh, but since he put it in the dock first, uh, my backup plan would be Mike Evans, who I find myself taking pretty regularly in the third round. I, I think he's a really good value there. He's, to me, a wide receiver one this season. So to be able to get him in the third is good. And then Brady's always a good value because nobody is hot and bothered by 
the old man Brady. You're getting him at least in the eighth round, if not in the double-digit rounds. So that's a stack that I am happy to go with. Mike Evans, Tom Brady, neither one costs a lot. So at their average draft position, I'm happy to pair them together. Mike? Uh, I really like Russell Wilson and Cortland Sutton, Denver Broncos duo, uh, and it comes down to you know the, the the actual ADP looking over on what's going on with the over on sleeper right now. Sutton's like a back of the fifth wide receiver going behind Allen Robinson and Michael Thomas, and I have my projections for Cortland Sutton are massive and Russ, who until last year with the injury had never finished outside the top twelve. Uh, as a fantasy quarterback and given you several years of elite production, like he's going, you know, in the seventh or eighth round. So I don't have to pay up for Russ. And I think that, that I think the top five finish is still in the range of outcomes for, for what Wilson could do if he's actually unleashed uh, in Denver. Let, let me ask you a follow up there, Mike, before I tell you mine, does having that stack in particular where you get a bargain on a guy like Cortland Sutton or in your mind a bargain right and then going with Russ later do you feel more committed to either player cuz at a certain point obviously you know if you're investing a higher draft capital pick on a wide receiver in a stack or a higher pick on a, a quarterback you know that's kind of your guy but if you're getting guys later do you feel like having the stack would like force you to lock those players into your lineup as opposed to if you had Sutton apart from Ru Russ, would you be more liable to move on from him if it wasn't working out? Uh, possible. Like the, the hard part for the Broncos is we just, we don't know for sure who will actually emerge. And even the three of us have a differing opinion on who that's going to be. Uh, I just, I think it's going to be Sutton and like, even if it's not him, so say I end up being incorrect on that with the, the, the back of the fifth, that's not too bad of a to take the shot there for what I think he could be. But for Russ, I think that we are we all in agreement that no matter who is like the best, you know, receive fantasy receiver for the Broncos, Russell Wilson's still gonna be a top ten guy yeah, by Russ, the end of the year. Russ will be top ten, yes. I, I at least agree with that. I don't know. Yeah, I, I have him ranked that way as well. I think I have him at seven or six. So we all agree there. We don't know where the target distribution will end up because it's a, a pretty diverse set of weapons in Denver and you haven't seen it before. It's ironic that we're talking about uh, that topic because I find myself actually, even though I said that Russ and Sutton are my kind of go-to stack, I don't actually land them often and what ends up happening is I get Tim Patrick in the double-digit rounds sure. when I've got Russell Wilson, and it's just a cheaper version of the stack where Tim Patrick isn't going to be a weekly must-start guy, but if I do start him on that week where I'm hoping for that touchdown, it's great to just stack with my quarterback. It, it, what's funny is that that particular stack is identical draft costs in redraft leagues for Jerry Judy pretty much. So it's somebody may want the exact same stack, but they may go with a different wide receiver shooting their shot that they get that value. My pair is, uh, it's pretty similar to what Jason's doing. If I can get CD in the top of the third round and then I can go get Dak in the seventh, who I think people have just some level of fatigue with Dak for whatever reason, I am pretty excited about that pair. I think CD is a top, you know, six wide receiver this season. I, Evans is tried and true. CD has the mysterious upside. And then Dak, you know, Brady, very similar costs. So that that's the one I would go with. Um, is, were there any other ones that just kind of popped up? Actually, there weren't. And when I say that, I mean, like, <laughs> usually I, lo I, 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 I enjoyed looking at this question. Cause Mooney I realized... and um, <laughs> yeah. Fields, and is that your... Look, if you want to go budget, Mooney and Fields. I, I don't, don't love it. a lot of the stacks this year. There are... Um, you know, like I, I like the value on Kirk Cousins, but most of the quarterbacks that I really, really like, like I'm, I'm in on Jalen Hurts a lot, but I don't like the value of AJ Brown for where he's being drafted right now. So most of the, the, the quarterbacks I like at the value, I don't love where their wide receivers are being drafted. There were also a number of, um, historically consistent stacks that have been deleted. Like Mahomes and Tyreek, that's gone, and mm -hmm. you don't have Adams and Rodgers anymore. So 
some of that has changed. Uh, it was interesting. I didn't have a whole bunch of them either when I was looking at it. Yeah. Sorry, did you catch me smirking? I uh, I can't help if you're on YouTube. I can't help <laughs> every time I look at the monitor. Uh, <laughs> laugh at Mike. I uh, I currently have. You're laughing at Mike. I'm laughing at my glasses. <laughs> oh, because you are. Because Wait, what have, you have one arm. I have one. Is that are these called arms on your glasses? The little I, um. That's yes. what I call them. Uh, I. <laughs> I have like the old school, you know, m one, <laughs> like the monocle glasses. Well, we were playing pickleball and the glasses flew off him. the head and they they exploded on the ground. And so now I'm hoping to get this fixed before our live show in Detroit next There's week. a chance he's doing the live show in Detroit with what you oh, see. Oh, this is fabulous. And it looks so ridiculous. Every time I see it, I'm, I'm just like, I, have, I just look so stupid. Dude, get a piece of elastic. And then, oh, and just, yeah. And just strap them to your head. Or commit to the monocle. I mean, you don't need uh, yeah, your you eyes will adjust. Eyes. Yeah. All right, news time. News and notes from around the league. There are, I mean, there are plenty of funny things on the monitor. So I wasn't sure which one you were trying to point out. I thought you might, might have been laughing at, you know, the mustache. And I was going to feel very disappointed in you. No, I, I love the mustache. It's a visual stage. delight today. Uh, DK Metcalf not present for mandatory minicamp. Contract talks have not yet resulted in a new deal. Yeah. This is a story for a number of players right now. Um, but let's talk about something. I mean, do you think he gets a deal? I guess I'll, I'll ask that question before I move on. Yeah, yes. I, th I think he gets a deal. You know, the, there were enough teams interested in paying a lot for a wide receiver on the trade market. They didn't choose to trade him so i think he gets a deal done um which you also believe about terry mclaurin i do i think both of those guys will get deals done all right this was this one's more interesting um the steelers Najee harris there was a report about reducing his role and Najee kind of came out and said like i'll be playing on certain downs which is just certainly not the case last year all the downs were Najee's, right. and so it's a very interesting situation. We, the three of us, we, you know, we didn't come together and um, discuss Najee before we projected him for the season, but we are lower on him than the consensus of industry experts. And that's before any of this news. And, you know, they have that kind of what might be non news about his playing weight. But Najee was so pass. Have it was such a pass heavy situation for his fantasy points. Like he was not a breakaway runner. Like he he had a lower percentage of fifteen plus yard runs than Leonard Fournette had last year. So that's and that was a problem that went back to collegiate days. Like that's not what he did. He did not have a significant amount of breakaway runs. Ran for a low yards per carry. So I think that was kind of what was behind some regression maybe in the in the receiving game without Big Ben, the noodle arm, have to find the underneath check down guy. You know, right now Mitch Trubisky's the quarterback. So that was kind of the core, but this is new about him maybe sharing some work, which is not a Mike Tomlin thing. So how do you reconcile this report this early? Yeah, I mean, when I when I view this, um, I, I take it with a grain of salt. It, Najee actually spoke about it. So whenever you get the player himself talking about it, you know it's it's better than a, a beat reporter trying to relay information. You hope that they're relaying it, you know, fairly. Um, Najee was saying that, you know, he's going to lose a little bit of work on some downs and that he completely understands it. They want to keep him healthy. But he also said, you know, we're we're still talking about it. So when push comes to shove, I think he's going to be on the field more often than not. But we were down on Najee before this solely because Mitchell Trubisky can run. Uh, Kenny Pickett can run. Whoever the quarterback is, they look like grease lightning compared to Ben Roethlisberger. <laughs> ben Roethlisberger <laughs> takes the ball. Uh, and then just checks it down immediately. That's not going to happen for Najee, and it's going to happen less if he loses uh, some work on third downs, which isn't necessarily where he was catching the ball. But, um, yeah, it, it's just he's a volume player, and he looks like he's going to get less volume this year. So his upside seems capped. Second most fantasy points on third down among all running backs last year. I'll, yeah, I'll say, which, it, like, there's just when you're saying, you know, maybe some reduced snaps. That doesn't necessarily like fully equate to a 
drastically reduced workload. You can you can have some downs where you know the running back is just pass protecting here. The running back is not really involved in this play design. Let's get him a a, a blow on the sideline so that he can you know rest up and be ready for when the running back actually has to take the ball. No doubt, no doubt. And then this morning um, out of Pittsburgh, Mitch Trubisky is quote the clear number one during minicamp. Well, he better be. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's step one, right? I mean, they, what that wasn't a hundred percent guarantee, but it's what you would expect with a rookie coming in. Yes. Uh, so, you know, Jason and I had some discussions, Mike, and you can weigh in about this situation in particular. And then we were bringing up last year with Andy Dalton and the Bears, and you know, we had this whole offseason debate on who's going to end up the starter in Chicago. Dalton starts the season, gets hurt. Justin Fields takes over. But I think we all knew that the Bears were going to lose some games last year, and that might have led to a transition at some point to Justin Fields organically. With Trubisky, you could see this team having some success even if Mitch isn't prolific. So do you – like, if Mitch starts the season as the quarterback, let me put it this way. Okay. He starts week one as the QB1. Do you think what do you think the odds are a change happens midseason with that team and how they, you know, how competitive they've been, regardless of their circumstance? Uh, greater than fifty percent. That a change you, does happen. Yeah, yeah. The it's and it's, you know, like maybe they're having. It, it really comes down to the record. I mean, they if they're having a ton of success and you're like these, they're up there. They're you know. They have a good chance to actually win the division with Mitch Trubisky. Then possibly you don't make the transition. But, I mean, eh. sooner than later you have to see, did did we make a good pick here with this first rounder? Or in next year's draft, are we actually back in the hunt hoping that someone falls to us again? I don't know if they're the type of franchise, though, that takes that approach. Like, they're much more likely to fit the mold of you know, what Kansas City and some of these teams that took a longer time getting their rookie on the field because of the success they've had. I mean, Big Ben was not impressive last year. They were in the hunt, and they were fighting all year long. Sure. I guess I just think it's – they're going to put Mitch in a position to have more success than, I don't know, the Falcons will with Marcus Mariota where we know <laughs> yeah, yeah. at some point they're going to make a decision, right? Like, you're going to be one in seven and saying, well, what do we have in Desmond Ritter? Yeah, I just it's, I, it's just a, a kind of a conversation is all. Sure, and, and, and I mean very difficult. How long did Ben play? Like four, 14 plus years? I don't even it was I mean You're I don't saying I we can't don't even have a comp for that right. situation. Yeah, Pittsburgh. we have no idea. We have no idea what Tom we had would, a few, will do. We had a few fun years, the the Cordell Stewart uh years and the pre Big Ben years where they were That's what I mean. Like I, it's hard to even think back historically of the NFL when Ben Roethlisberger was not the quarterback for the Steelers. Did you want to weigh in there, Jason? No, I, I think I'm uh, right in the middle between you guys. I still think there's a good chance Kenny Pickett starts the season. Obviously, this was a very important piece of news to me because I, I've i been projecting Kenny Pickett to be the week one starter, and I do agree with you. If Mitchell Trubisky is the week one starter – there's a solid chance that, you know, he's winning enough games to keep alive. I mean, he got the Bears to the playoffs uh, twice, I believe. And so, uh, you know, he might just keep that job. And I do think that that has an effect on the receiving options. Right now I've got uh, Deontay Johnson statted out for a rookie quarterback, and I think it would be better if Trubisky is the starter. Antonio Gibson suffered a minor hamstring injury during OTAs. <laughs> Yeah, it's not my favorite. You don't. It's like the Penny news from a couple weeks ago. He'll probably be fine, but you hate players that have been banged up getting banged up this early. And Al, I don't. I don't want Brian Robinson to have a chance. Right? Like, you're worried about what he'll do with it. Yeah. I mean, is he good? I'm. I'm not exactly sure. But the, you're, you'll find out sooner than later if Gibson's on the sideline. Alan Lazard, not at Packers mandatory minicamp. He was an RFA. They tendered him at was it a second, second. or third? Okay. So he wants a he wants a new deal. Yeah, yeah he's not hey, signed flex that. On flex on him. And I I mean, I, I don't blame him. This is pretty much a golden opportunity where exactly. you could say the Packers actually need you. 
because usually you're Alan Lazard and they don't. But wait a minute. Wait a minute. Matt LaFleur <laughs> told reporters that Sammy Watkins is going to be a big <laughs> part of oh. the offense. What do you think about that? I think that's cold-blooded. cold-blooded. Yeah, but tell me that some part in the deep recesses of your non-lizard <laughs> mind, you're not saying to yourself, what if that's true? I, because of what quarterback he has. This is uh, it, in a world where Sammy Watkins comes out and has extreme relevance. I will be so thrilled. I mean, that will be just such a fun time. He will have relevance till the moment you are in. Oh, yeah. The moment you go in and you finally say, no, he's done it. He's proven it. Watch out. So here's my advice to you. Also week one. At, yeah, I was going to say, at the week end, one, Sammy Watkins, how are you not? How is that not just an automatic selection? Be in on Sammy week one DFS. Draft him with one of your last picks in the draft and trade him in the uh, after week one. That's the that's the uh, Sammy Watkins game plan. Well, I, look the the truth is the Packers wide receiver situation. It's murky. Like Christian Watson, Sammy Watkins, Alan Lazard, uh, R Randall Cobb. If Sammy Amari Watkins, Rogers. Be, because of what you're saying, if Sammy Watkins comes out and has 10 targets and seven receptions for 140 yards and oh, a touchdown, gosh. everyone will be convinced. <laughs> I, I know we've seen it before, but everyone will be convinced they, ha they need him and he looked good and he's the one. You will be able to trade. Uh, you'll be able to trade him for a lot. And here's the thing. You're going to go, oh, maybe I shouldn't. Does it seem? Maybe I should hold on to him. Maybe he's the guy. Don't. Don't do it. it. Don't do it. Oh, 100% we will all fall for it. <laughs> I mean, that, that will happen. There's nobody that ever, when something great happens, it's easy to see it repeating in a situation where your other options are those guys we mentioned. But it'll be, th thank you, Sammy, for being relevant again. Thank you for coming, uh, bringing another year of joy to this podcast. <laughs> all right, quick break, then we'll hit the wild cards. Well, it is time for our annual Fantasy Wild Cards episode, looking at players with a wide range of outcomes. It's time to do it. No, I'm saying, no, the brakes. Guys, why aren't the brakes working? Because I cut the brakes! Wild card! Yeah! All right, fantasy wild cards. Mike has a grin on his face. Enjoyed That's that just, drop very much. I do, and it was fun that Jason announced himself as the wild card at the top of the show, and he was in fact the wild card in the drop. Yeah. Oh, I see. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, Cordero Patterson is my fantasy wild card number one that I'm going to bring up, and these are players that look you can make a a pretty strong and compelling argument for why they could be good and why they could be bad heading into the season. Now, look, our our research team, look, it's vast. We have access to all the the, the authentic fantasy football libraries. So Kyle will go in and he'll take books off the shelf and research deeply. And he searched for historical templates and fantasy football comparisons for, you know, 31-year-old hybrid running back wide receivers who just finished with their first top 30 season of their entire career now entering their 10th season in the NFL. And, mm -hmm. and so he ran the algos, searched Huge the dark list. web. Big list, big list. Um, no, there's none. There's none. There's Cordero. That's it. He is literally, like if you had to define what a fantasy wild card is, to me it's Cordero Patterson heading into this year, where here are the facts. I mean, he was the RB9 last year, a top 10 fantasy producer, and 52 receptions, 153 carries, Look, he almost had more carries last year than he had his in in the entire pre his entire career before last season. So it was even better than that, really, in the weeks that were relevant in the beginning of the year. He was the RB seven in total points from weeks two to fourteen. Look, he pooped the bed at the end of the season. But, you know, RB fifty six, thirty one, thirty seven, seventy. If I had played Boston Scott instead of him in the fantasy title game, I'd be a winner right now so 
that's the good, right? I, you know, if if you want a running back that's going to average four plus targets a game. That could be Cordero this year. And how valuable is a target? How valuable is a reception at the running back position? He scored more fantasy points as a receiver. And you get to play him at, you know, on some platforms like Sleeper, you can play him in both spots. So that's the good story, right? You get, and they don't have a lot of weapons. Drake London, rookie coming in, Kyle Pitts. They, we, need, they need him. They need him. Or <laughs> fantasy wild card. You see more of what you saw at the very end of last year. He falls apart. He's getting older. Damian Williams. I know that that Maybe. name. I know that that name, even especially for me, brings a lot of like, like, well, I've already had the funeral for him. But I'm going to tell you, Foot Clan, the situation, it's going to be an opportunity for Damian Williams. And this team has shown last year, they had no problem playing a guy that was kind of meh. Mike Davis got a ton of snaps. So Damian Williams, process. Tyler Algier, going for the first pick in the draft. So if you don't get the touchdowns, if you don't get the you know the the strange games where he was really you know he had multiple touchdown games I think two times last year, it could be bad. And so I haven't ranked the highest. I still think he's essential to this offense. But do I? Am I scared? Oh, I'm very scared. And it's Mariota. It's not Matt Ryan. Like, Matt Ryan's a very good quarterback. Mariota is not. No, it's a problem. End of sentence. No, you don't need to expound on that anymore, Mike. <laughs> I mean, 31-year-old hybrid run running back. Jason and I were trying to determine which NFL teams on the footcast today are the bottom group because we were trying to figure out where Houston could – who could beat Houston to the bottom – it's like Atlanta has that on lockdown down oh, there yeah. in the bottom three. And Kyle's not here today, but he would just affirm what I'm saying. So I think Patterson is the a very wide range of of helping your team at a great average draft position, right? On underdog, he's the RB29 right now. Finished nine last year. You don't need nine. You get RB15, 20, you got a value, right? Yeah, I mean, it. it it's kind of crazy. The fact that the uh, top 10 running back from last year, who's in pretty much the exact same position this year, um, is someone that I just r never draft. I mean, and, and this isn't like a high up pick, I, middle, late rounds. I'm like, eh, no, no, thank you. <laughs> and uh, you're right. It's important that we remember how good he was for fantasy, uh, especially the first half of last year, because he very well could be relevant again. I don't think it's going to happen. I have a hard time drafting him. I like going with the youth. But the flexibility helps. The flexibility I mean, on Sleeper, helps. being able to – you've got injuries all season long. Being able to drop him into either wide receiver or running back is a luxury. Yeah, that is very nice. Um, the way that I like to draft my wild cards is young guys who've shown some flashes versus the old guys. And so my first fantasy wild card – is Kadarius Toney, wide receiver for the New York Giants. Last year, a rookie who was both incredible and also worthless, did nothing. Um, he missed half the season, majority of the season. F feels like he didn't even play last year, except in a few stretches where he became the starter and dominated. I mean, he went out there a couple weeks in a row – and he had, you know, nine targets, six receptions, 78 yards, 13 targets, 10 receptions, 189 yards. Oh, yeah. I remember he, playing that weekend, eh, Andy? Remember when we played Darius Tony against Jason in the faceoff? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That was sweet. Yeah, yeah that, that was, was real sweet, sweet for you guys. <laughs> then, Kader of course, Darius won me some money that week. Yeah. Then he gets injured. So it was like, oh, man, this brilliant superstar looking rookie who I, I know people always throw around like the. Man, he could be a Tyreek Hill. And it's like, no, you can't. But he's one of the only players that I've ever seen on the NFL field that was like, whoa. He just makes other NFL defenders look just stupid because he turns on these after jets and just burns <laughs> you people. You didn't want to go with burners because you want to say burns later. <laughs> yeah, the after, after jets. After jets? <laughs> yeah. It was sitting there. You even started the B sound. Yeah. You yeah. moved. Well, I you got to. But he you burns pivoted people, from so. burns to jets. It works. Once he came back from his injury, he These had are another my now game. Jets. Those are my after jets. Right. <laughs> he had another game with twelve 
targets. I mean, he was, and then he got injured again. So it was like he couldn't stay on the field. But if you look at Mike, you talked about it a lot last year. Yards, uh, or I'm sorry, targets per, Target route, per route run. run. Yeah, that has been such a truly predictive, telling statistic that uh, that's how we saw you know the Antonio Brown beautiful fantasy breakout uh that that was coming and we've we've seen it just be a really successful metric he was targeted on his routes uh, more than like Cooper Cup more i mean in an enormous rate he has the fourth highest rate among 77 rookie wide receivers with 50 plus targets since 2014 and at the same time that he was getting targeted on his routes run he ran 2.1 yards per route run, which puts him in an elite rookie group. Here's the rookie wide receivers that have averaged that. Odell Beckham Jr., A.J. Brown, Justin Jefferson, Jamar Chase, Tyreek Hill, Juju Smith-Schuster, and Kadarius Toney. I mean, that is the elite of elite when you think of rookie breakout wide receiver seasons. We just didn't get to see him on the field. So you've got Brian Dable coming to town. Maybe he fixes the offense. He costs you nothing. He's in the ninth or tenth round of drafts. You're you're going, do I want Tyler Boyd or Michael Gallup or Kadarius Toney, who could be a superstar? So that's the great side. He could also, I mean, he could be not part of the Giants by week one. He's had off the field issues. They go and they sign Wandale Robinson or draft Wandale Robinson, who is kind of a similar build and type of player as Kadarius Tony. And then there's Daniel Jones, who's trash. And uh, you know his his here's his top wide receivers that Daniel Jones has supported. Darius Slayton was wide receiver 35. Sterling Shepard wide receiver 49. Kenny Galladay wide receiver 84 in 2019, 2020, and 2021. So. Tony could be nothing, but I'm willing to take the shot because of the brilliance we saw in short, short stretches on the field and his youth. I go with the youth wild cards. It's Tony is very difficult because in the games that he succeeded last year, and again, you're looking at those metrics across like what 57 targets last year. How much was a byproduct of intention and how much was a byproduct of absence? Mm -hmm. And you get Kenny G back and you know, say whatever you will about him. They paid him a lot of money to come in and be a, a primary target. Like you said, they drafted Wandale. I don't know. Did they mean to do that with Kadarius Tony last year in a volume perspective, or did they have to? I remember the first time that he had his breakout target performance thinking that wasn't him. That was the fact that they didn't have anyone else to go to. Uh, but as the season went on, as he got injured and came back, there were still other people around. And Sterling Shepard is gone now. He had a late season Achilles um, injury. So... I mean, TBD, but he is a true wild card. I, I can't imagine him being a meh fantasy player. He's either going to be great or just be irrelevant, and we won't remember his name in five years. I think you're right. I mean, essence of a wild card, and young enough to where the, the volatility, the unknown, the upside, it's all there still. It's not like we've it's expired. He has that all in him. Um, Mike, who's your first wild card? All right, the first guy I want to talk about is... Uh, the newly signed Kansas City Chief wide receiver Marquez Valdez-Scantling. Not Juju. I want to talk about MVS here because what is going to happen in Kansas City and because like the, the knowns of Kansas City, okay, Patrick Mahomes, in, in the range of outcomes for Patrick Mahomes, 5,000-plus yards, 40-plus touchdowns. They, uh, you know, set the, the, the news world on fire when Tyreek Hill, there's like grumblings from Adam Schefter's uh, timeline that, oh, Tyreek Hill, you know, they can't reach a contract extension and uh, now maybe maybe they'll trade him. And he's been traded to the Dolphins. And then, okay, we get to the draft. What what are the, what are the Kansas City Chiefs going to do for the wide receiver position? And the answer was nothing. Their answer was they brought in Juju on a one-year deal, by whatever the base was, like, a couple million, and yes, it, it can hit ten million if he hits his incentives and, and reaches his you know statistical output that he needs to. But they also brought in MVS for a three-year, thirty million dollar deal. Like this was a guy that they went after as a potential replacement, and there are some things about it that it makes sense. Like he's never 
MVS has never shown out on a football field on any sort of consistent basis, but we have seen several spike weeks from him because he's big and he's fast. Like his speed score is actually truly an elite speed score for for how fast he is and how large he is. Tyreek Hill, twenty five percent of those targets from last year, those those are gone. MVS led all wide receivers in average depth of target, seventeen and a half yards. <laughs> like that's where he is going down the field and that's something that Patrick Mahomes can absolutely excel in but at the same time we have never seen MVS in he's had several opportunities of like you need the Green Bay Packers need Valdez Scantling this week to, to truly step up and be a number one guy but he has not done it and yet the team with their actions and their money have said we think that he can come in and not replace Tyreek Hill, but be a big part of the solution in replacing the numbers and the production and the targets that Tyreek Hill was taking. So I'm just like, he's going, you know, extremely late in, in best ball. He's going in the ninth round as the wide receiver 48 in sleeper. Even later than that, the the consensus, at least draft picks right now, are they drafters believe it's easily going to be Juju as the number one option for this for this team at the wide receiver position. And I think that it could be MVS. And while I'm not saying that he is anywhere near Tyreek, we're not saying top 10 is in the option here for Valdez Scanling, but like the guy could easily be a wide receiver three and he's not being drafted anywhere close to that. And like, cause again, we've never seen it, but the money is there. No team has wanted Juju the last two years. At least no one's willing to give him an extended contract. No one's willing to give him a contract of note. And yet here comes Valdez Scantling right out the gate with a three-year, $30 million deal to play with Patrick Mahomes and have the option to be the number one wide receiver who could be great and could be absolutely nothingness. He's certainly a huge wild card. The... Biggest case against MVS for me is that they've done this before with Sammy Watkins. They gave him three sure. years, $48 million, and he peaked at 52 total receptions, 40, 52, 37. So, like, I don't know. Like, Patrick Mahomes has come out and said it's going to have to go a lot of different places this year. But it's an interesting bet for a player that, you know, has explosiveness. But I don't know if he can get over 50 catches. That's the part that's like – Tyreek gave you both. Tyreek yes. gave you all of the Juju Kelsey underneath, and he gave you all of the MVS over the top. So it's definitely hard. a wild card. Yeah, it's certainly a wild, wild card. But it is so hard to trust a guy who's had the opportunity before and failed. And it's like, well, you didn't have Patrick Mahomes. Uh, you had Aaron Rodgers. Like He's he's had a first ballot Hall of Fame quarterback. He's had the opportunity. He's He's the same guy. I don't trust it. Okay. I guess it's up to me, huh? Mm -hmm. I'm going to bring up a bigger name that I think is a fantasy wild card because the cost, like people are paying up for him. I see trades for him with a lot of excitement, and, and I think he's a wild card. Michael Pittman, Mike. We're all very excited. Can Michael, someone hit the drop, please? Uh, I, I can't do that. Uh, Deucers, help me out. I need a wild card version. Do we have Do we have Pity City? This we is built this Thank city. you. Yeah, that was unbelievable. How is that not just ready to go? Did you know he was going to talk about Michael Pittman? I figured I would hit it later, Mike, but you really set it up, set it up early. I don't know what to do with Michael Pittman. I know that there's a really strong case for him at least maintaining a tremendous amount of value. He's he's like we all have him ranked pretty similarly. Mike has him at twelve. Jason and I at fourteen. Um. His underdog ADP is 14. So we're like, with the consensus, we all have him ranked very fairly. Last year, finished as the wide receiver 15. I think that's where the beginning of the question marks begin to emerge uh, is a projection for him to move forward. And I know a lot of that is based on this hope that, look, Matt Ryan produces wide receiver one fantasy finishes. That's what he's always done. Roddy White, Julio Jones, Calvin Ridley, very briefly. Yeah. Uh, but Michael Pittman has been somewhat touchdown dependent, and you had a tale of two cities, two pity cities last year. Wide receiver nine from weeks one through nine 
wide receiver 30 from week 10 on. And there was no one to throw the ball to in Indianapolis. And I agree. I think on the other, uh, a couple weeks ago, Mike, you said, look, I'm not really worried about the competition for Michael Pittman. That's totally fair. Uh, they should have a little bit more. Whether it, it would not challenge him for the number one role, he will be their number one receiver. I am just very interested and curious about what that will mean this year. Matt Ryan, he's an aging quarterback. This is a team that really saw success with Jonathan Taylor over the back half of the year, which I think coincided with wide receiver 30 for Michael Pittman over the back half of the year. And not that I expect them to have Paris Campbell for the whole year, but they what they drafted Alec Pierce and they have some other options. So I actually my question about the wild card nature of Michael Pittman is if you draft him at his ceiling at wide receiver 14, if that's his ceiling, you can't really you don't have upside, but you only have downside. So that's my fear for him is that he's being overdrafted, is two touchdown dependent, and can't take a step forward. He may just be what he was. Yeah, I, I think he very well might be what he was. But if you draft a wide receiver at wide receiver 14 and they end up being the wide receiver 13, 14, 15, that's fine. That's great. Yeah, you that. knew what you were drafting, and I'm happy to take that. Um, you, you have the hope of upside, and maybe that's where you don't see the uh, the ascension. But it's really a matter of what, what do you believe about the talent of Pittman? Because the opportunity is Zach Pascal was their number two target last year. He's gone. Jack Doyle's retired. T.Y. T Hilton is seemingly forcibly retired right now. So, I mean, you, you've got Ashton Doolin, who was is like the next man up. He had 22 targets last year. So Pittman's going to have the opportunity. It's just a matter of do you think if he gets 145 targets, he could be a top five guy, or do you think he just doesn't have that in his not a chance uh, ability? No, I don't think so. And you know, six touchdowns last year. I think he could go north. I think yeah, he could. yeah, I, I, yeah. And that's that's what makes him very interesting. I think he is a wild card. He only had you know three finishes on any week above where we have him ranked right now. So you didn't see a lot of ceiling. You did see dis disappearing acts over the back half of the year. Um, it's just hard for me to imagine him. 129 targets last year, 88 receptions last year. It's hard yeah, for you me gotta, to like, imagine you gotta him Carson just Wentz, busting. Uh, handicap those targets. Yeah, but like Carson 129 Wentz. 129 from Carson Wentz is like 89 from Matt Ryan. He threw, what, 27 touchdowns, which Matt Ryan didn't do. And Matt Ryan's career touchdown rate is known for being average. I mean, he just doesn't throw touchdowns. Julio never had him for years. That's a concern, too. Like, if I'm – look, Matt Ryan – throws interceptions in the end zone, but I'd be handing the ball off to Jonathan Taylor if I was Matt Ryan around the red zone. So I, I just, I don't see, I don't, I think he's a wild card when it comes to upside, but I think a lot of people think he can be top five. Yeah. So I understand that your, makes him interesting. I do understand your argument. My main thing and why I'm kind of pro Pittman is not for his upside. It's actually because I don't think he has, a, I don't think there's a world where he's not a top 24 wide receiver. It's just too many targets he's too necessary to be just just completely sucking me an outright bust other than getting injured this next player is a guy I think could just be a complete bust that you're holding the bag and you go whoopsie doozles I shouldn't have drafted I, I'm definitely gonna say that Adam Thielen really who I love <laughs> I'm not hooked on a theme. <laughs> oh, was that the drop? That was the sad. That was the sad version of the drop. Um, so right now he's being drafted as the wide receiver 29. So it doesn't cost you a tremendous amount. What? He's going in the seventh round. What? And this is a guy in Adam Thielen who's just been great for pretty much his entire career. He's been awesome. Last year. He was, I think, great. Now, he only played 13 games, so he finishes the wide receiver 28, but obviously that was in only 13 games. He was great around the end zone. He had double-digit touchdowns in 13 games. Every time you got near the end zone, you watched Adam Thielen just make someone look like an idiot, torch him with a simple route, and somehow end up wide open for a touchdown in the end zone. Nothing on film said that Adam Thielen should be bad should have lost a step I mean obviously uh, at some point the end comes Adam Thielen played his age 31 season this last year and he was very very good and he's a touchdown machine on a good offense so his upside when you grab him in the seventh round I mean if he ends up with 14 touchdowns you're gonna be a wide receiver one his upside is 
being a wide receiver one. But the downside, he's going to be 32. And I know that it, we always feel like, well, it'll never go away for people. But I just I, – I always have a hard time shaking the, the Jordy Nelson comp that he's received for a long time. When Jordy Nelson was 31 years old, he had 1,257 yards, 13 touchdowns, was awesome, 97 receptions. In his year 32, he played 15 games, only had 482 yards, six touchdowns. The career was over. It was done. It was kaput. Um, it's one of those things where when you get to age 32 – we it, it it's not always it's not always great the great ones the absolute great, Marvin Harrison Randy Moss Larry Fitzgerald they defy the the age the the that that measure of age thirty two, um but the wheels have fallen off for plenty of others Tory Holt A J Green Brandon Marshall that age thirty two year is awful and the reality for Adam Thielen is. If the touchdowns don't come, he doesn't seem like a possession guy anymore. You know, he was always this this player with Kirk Cousins, who's 155 targets, 113 receptions, just unbelievable. Last year, 67 receptions, 726 yards. It, it was the touchdowns that really kept him afloat. And if those don't come, I think he will, staying healthy, being still good, will be a mediocre wide receiver that doesn't help you. And I think that there's a good chance that you just end up saying goodbye and saying, I've got your jersey on my wall. I thank you for the championships you've gotten me in the past, but I'm done. And this is where I'm very ageist. I find myself bypassing him in every draft because I don't want to hold the bag when it's full of poop. Doug, no one wants is, that. I mean, there's, it's a reasonable thing. I, I guarantee you – that we could go back to the tape of last summer and find some of those quotes about Adam Thielen. And that's the oh, interesting from, from me. Yeah. I from was out. Yeah. Just, that's the interesting thing about the age is you, you're just, you don't want to be caught holding the bag, but if you didn't want to be caught holding the bag last year, you would have maybe paid the price. Cause you wouldn't what have gotten if the bag has a poop and a cinnamon roll in it. Mm. Interesting. I'm not going to eat it, but I'm saying, are you still going to hold cinnamon roll to wrapped? Does it like overtake the scent? I think the scent of poop would win out there. Over cinnamon, over cinnamon, yeah, yeah, I do. Mm. I mean, I one way to find out, Mike. But I don't know if there's a lot of cinnamon bun like um, bathroom, like the things you plug in, like a scented, uh, like a scented, like a, glade? Can, a scented glade for the, to cover over the bathroom smell. I haven't heard, I haven't done the cinnamon I over. Like, I feel like cinnamon could handle it. <laughs> I I still go back to is this cinnamon roll wrapped. That is very important in the you. in the turd on what no no on whether I want to hold the bag. Oh yeah 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 okay it's protected and look, it's fair touchdowns are going to be a part of it but I think that, that at this point in time we've accepted that that's part of what you're getting with Adam Thielen is you're you're attempting to draft ten touchdowns am I right yeah that's what you're going it's after pretty wild you know he's not going to be a hundred reception guy anymore this is Justin Jefferson's team he's the second option and you know kj osborne looked good you're getting irv smith back there's you do there's, have a new new offense yeah you've got a new Kevin offense is that is that good for a 32 year old well i'd be I like let's change systems i mean i think you can still learn things at 32 jason i stopped learning things at 30 mm -hmm. mike i'm glad you're bringing up this player to finish our wild card segment because we discussed Elijah Moore and Garrett Wilson a little bit on the footcast. Mm. You have Elijah Moore as your final wild card. Yeah, so Elijah Moore of the New York Jets coming into his second year. Um, he's, you know, in best ball right now, wide receiver 32, which is, that's not too bad. Finishes his rookie year with 77 targets, 43 for over 500, and five touchdowns. Only appeared in 11 games. Um, was really exploding onto the scene. And then, unfortunately, had the season-long injury. And what what I believe is known about Elijah Moore is he is good. Like, draft Twitter got, we got Elijah Moore correct, where he fell, you know, into the second round, which that's not a huge deal. But the guy is electric. Like, he can, he can get open from weeks 9 through 13. He was, in fact, the wide receiver, too, in, in all of fantasy football. And that's a decent stretch. That's a good stretch run to be putting up huge points. But 
Zach Wilson was only his quarterback for two of those games. And in one of those games, Wilson, or Elijah Moore was fantastic. In one of those, Elijah Moore was eh, not so great. And even in, in that run, like Elijah Moore for some of those games was commanding over 30% of the targets. Like he was an absolute stud. Jason uh, uh, referenced Kadarius Tony on the targets per route run. Elijah Moore is is up there as well of the that selection that Jason talked about. Elijah Moore, 11th best in uh, in his targets per route run. It's like, it's proven Elijah Moore is a good NFL wide receiver. But now we have introduced other question marks to this that, like, well, I mean, it's number one. Like I said, his run was mostly not with Zach Wilson. Is Zach Wilson actually good? It's still TBD. If you're going off of year one, the answer is a resounding no. Um, like, he, in 2021, had the worst completion rate over expectation in the NFL. There's already OTA whisperings and rumblings that he's still struggling with his accuracy. And now, the team spent a first-round pick on Garrett Wilson. It's also TBD. I mean, this is why this is such a wild card. We, don't, we, we have so many unknowns. Is Garrett Wilson, will it translate to him being an elite NFL player? I think that the odds are are good in his favor. And then, so now can Zach Wilson actually sustain fantasy value for two different wide receivers on a season-long level? And in my heart, as much as I love Elijah Moore and Garrett Wilson, I don't think that Zach Wilson will be able to sustain both of them for any real long, consistent long-term stretch over the course of the season. But Elijah Moore is so good, and you you want to bet on the talent. You want to bet on a guy who separates. A, a separator is truly a quarterback, a young quarterback's best friend, knowing that this player, I'm going to see them actually be open. I don't just have to trust that it's a 50-50 ball. I can see the path where, where this ball has to go. But if Garrett Wilson is the actual alpha wide receiver that the Jets believe he is when they took him, uh, where I don't remember where he went. Drake London went first, and then Elijah or uh, and then Garrett Wilson went. Like very, very high in the NFL draft. So they're betting a huge amount that Garrett Wilson is truly a stud, and that type of stud does he does take away from what Elijah Moore could actually be. Like I said, where in that run, Elijah Moore seeing thirty plus percent of the targets per game. Like you aren't seeing thirty plus percent of the targets if Garrett Wilson is actually as good as as the New York Jets hope he is. So for a sixth round pick in best ball, he'll probably be a sixth, seventh round pick in redraft as well. Like that's like that's there's a lot of variables and unknowns where in that range you can find a a a player who doesn't have all those concerns and yet has upside, except I don't know if they have the upside of if Elijah Moore hits, he could be a true difference maker for your fantasy team. But I'm concerned that he won't. Well, I you made a lot of the arguments that I think I agree with with this team. Garrett Wilson, six foot, one ninety nine. Elijah Moore's five ten, one eighty. Uh, and Wilson's more prototypically. And Corey Davis is still there. Yeah, and he he profiles to be a, a key part of the offense, like you said. So my biggest fear of drafting Elijah Moore is that I'm drafting a player that isn't quite good enough to want to play, but isn't quite bad enough to want to drop. And that's my right. least favorite type of player to draft. And again, that's going to come back to your confidence in Zach Wilson, but the likelihood of him supporting more than one potentially top 15 option, top 20 option seems low to me. At best, it could be a ping pong thing. It's an Elijah Moore game, Garrett Wilson game, somebody else. Uh, if things go well and he gets a lot of those numbers up that he wasn't sustaining last year. Yeah, I mean, uh, the the reality is it's going to come down to Zach Wilson. I drafted Zach Wilson in a startup over the summer because you have the hopes of what makes a player the number two drafted player in the in the NFL draft and all the rumors and Tony Romo saying he's going to be the next Patrick Mahomes. And look, there are flashes of brilliance. And so you hope that coming into this season, whatever off time he has taken has really helped him. And the first word out of OTAs that we get to see how Zach Wilson has developed is he struggled with accuracy. And it's like, I already feel like I'm putting the first nail in that coffin. So I am, uh, I am pessimistic right now about 
really all the receiving options for the Jets because it all comes down to Zach Wilson. All right, it's underdog fantasy time. Best Ball Breakdown, presented by Underdog Fantasy. Okay, Best Ball Breakdown. Every week leading up to the season, we're giving tips, little insights, observations for playing best ball in Underdog Fantasy. Little BBB. <laughs> Thank Just you. A little yeah. one. Thank you from the show Wildcard. Uh, <laughs> look, we, we spend a lot of time talking about not overemphasizing late season schedules at this time, right? We don't know how defenses are going to change over the course of a year. Our strength is scheduled tool in the UDK. We, we focus a lot on the first few weeks of the year. Maybe you're picking a defense out. However, it's very interesting. Um, one of the insights looking into underdog and who won best ball mania and who was successful. It was on the back of incredible late season matchups with a lot of upside and a lot of correlation. For example, that Kansas City Cincinnati bonanza won a lot of people uh, fantasy championships and won a lot of people uh, best ball championships because you had the Joe Burrow Jamar Chase correlation. You had Daryl Williams in that game if people stacked him. This was an Daryl Williams was an 18th round pick at the end of the draft. So you're looking at game environments that maybe right now you don't need a lot more information to know that they're going to be pretty good. Mm -hmm. And so you, you can isolate some week 17 games right now that look like that's probably going to be a bonanza type of game, even though we don't know how these defenses are. And uh, I mean, three of these teams are in the same division, but week 17 Denver in Kansas city. Oh, that's baby. on the docket this year. And so you've got options, right? The big ones, the Mahomes, the Russell Wilson's, but where this where this information really benefits you in best ball drafts is maybe looking at some of the Daryl Williams type of picks later. The Jerry Judy, the Tim Patrick, um, the MVS, like Mike brought him up as a wild card wild earlier card. today. Or Sky, thank you, Mike. Or Sky Moore, right? Some of these players could be late see uh late best ball draft picks that have great championship week upside. The Rams play the Chargers in Week 17. So, yes, you've got the prolific top-end options, but you've also got the Van Jeffersons, the Allen Robinsons, Josh Palmer, Gerald Everett, those kind of players. Look, you needed those type of boom Week 17 games in order to win. You needed them for best ball titles. So what you're saying, if I'm hearing you right, is, is draft Gabriel Davis – Oh, baby. Because the Cincinnati Bengals are playing the Buffalo Bills in Week 17. Yeah, baby. Uh, you, you, ha you have really uh, gone ping pong on Gabriel Davis this offseason. I have. But you're right now, now all the way back in. Yeah, I'm in. I'm I mean, this is like the stock market. Water you know, you're, is warm. Yes. Uh, Minnesota and Green Bay as well for Week 17, with, which is a game that has a lot of potential options. It could make that decision for you late in best ball drafts of taking a Christian Watson, a Sammy Watkins um, late, late in these drafts. There's a lot of potential upside uh, in week 17 matchups. So you can also, one, that's how you take down a tournament. Yes. Uh, so what, what we're saying is if you're playing the best ball mania, look at week 17. We also just put out a brand new, if you've got the ultimate draft kit, we redid the strength of schedule tool. It is unbelievably amazing. It shows everyone's schedule, every position, and you can actually choose whatever weeks you want. So you can go to that tool and just select week 17, and you could compare what have good, you know, good big uh, Vegas style matchups with what projects to be good for certain positions. So check that out. Uh, the strength of the schedule tool, just, just know it's been completely reworked and it's awesome. All right, that was Best Ball Breakdown presented by Underdog Fantasy. Start playing on Underdog today, right now. They'll match your first deposit up to $100 if you use the code BALLERS. That is going to do it for today's episode of the show. Great to have Mike back on board. Oh, it's good to be back. And looking forward to, look, the next time uh, we record a show, we're going to be in Detroit. Now, that live show will end up being... What episode? Thursday episode? It'll be the the, the Tuesday. following Tuesday? Tuesday week. Yep. 
So we're going to record that, package it up. You guys will get to see that. Just hold and, on to your butts. Yeah, it's I mean, gonna be crazy. it's going to be intense. Brooks in his hometown. Oh, the man. energy. Can't wait to see that. Hey, oh. They're going to carry him around, the crowd. I know it. You going to crowd surf? Brooks? Yeah, he's going to crowd surf. Motown oh. crowd surfing. Oh, yeah. So, um, and a reminder if you want more of the three of us for some reason, you can check out the Spitballers podcast as well. Oh, um, yeah. That is our weekly comedy show where we talk about things uh, that, that are really matter. That are stupid for way too long, is what I was going to say. But you're right. The things that really matter in life. If you need to make your Mondays a little bit better, check it out. Until next time, Mike Wright, Jason Moore, Andy Holloway, thank you for joining us. Take care. Goodbye. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Join our fantasy football community on jointhefoot.com and follow us on Twitter at the FFBallers.